welcome from my side also to all of you. It's very good to be back. Always a pleasure to be at AUA and uh, to visit Yerevan. I actually, I think my collaboration or, yeah, my contribution to this collaboration, let's say, is a little bit younger. I, uh, I was there for the first Kodaska workshop, which was in 2018. So that was the first time I visited. And uh, I have to say, I was very impressed by Yerevan. I was very impressed by, by the university. So I decided to come back. And that's what I've keep been doing since now. And I hope I can do, keep doing that. And try to, like, we, we try to, like, um, move it further from the workshop over a summer school that we had now to actually maybe go even more into research collaborations in the future. Yeah, okay. So, there's not much else I think I can say. Um, it's always good to be among friends. Thank you for having us again. And yeah, I think we should get started. If we start early, we have more time for discussions. So let's do that, right? Okay? Cool. I'm already starting. Okay. Um, so do I actually have a presenter? Yes. 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 Wonderful. Okay. So. My talk today is um, more like a high-level overview on some work we've been doing. And uh, we will hear some more presentations, some more talks from, from the group going into more detail. But I'm just trying to give you, as I was saying, a short, brief overview on what we are actually doing. Before we do that, maybe some words about us, who we are, where we're from. So, I'm a professor at the University of Duisburg-Essen, professor for computer science. Duisburg-Essen is on the west side of Germany, in the old coal and steel area in Germany. Um, actually, one of the most densely populated regions in Europe. And the university is one of the 10 biggest universities in, in Germany, more than 40,000 students with a faculty for computer science with roughly 30 professors and about 5,000 students. Actually, I'm lying a little bit because the faculty is just being established. We used to have two different faculties and we have a merger now. So we're coming together. Um, I'm leading the Embedded Systems Lab. And our mission is essentially to make embedded systems smart. To put machine learning, deep learning, AI on the embedded systems. Um, and as you can see, we have a number, a variety of topics that we actually try to address, starting from uh, software model optimizations, then going to hardware optimizations, both digital and analog hardware accelerators for machine learning to transformers, quantization for transformers, hardware-aware neural architecture search, and deep learning for neuro implants. And as we're saying, some of the people on this picture are actually here, and we'll tell you in more detail about their work later. I just want to introduce the overall framework for this. We also build hardware. It's actually very important for us not to just do theoretical work or software, but actually to do the full end-to-end -end work and also develop the hardware devices um, to showcase and evaluate our systems. So for example, um, on the left you see a small example which is essentially a system for gesture recognition using infrared. So very simple. Uh, potentially you could use this as uh, for, for a smartwatch or something and you can just directly with the sensors and a relatively simple AI, you can just directly um, get the gestures and the finger movements. But that's one example, and we're building many, many other soft, uh, hardware and software parts. Okay, so in this talk, 
I briefly want to talk about what we call the Elastic AI ecosystem, which is our overall framework in which our work is conducted. Then I want to talk, I'll give one example for a model optimization technique, and then I will conclude. I don't really have time enough for more, but if you're interested, of course, I hope we can talk about this for hours during the next few days. So the, the central claim behind our work is that we see a clear development for AI to move closer to its data sources. We used to have AI or machine learning systems that were operated somewhere in the cloud. So you have your local sensors, you get your data, and then you send everything over uh, the internet to a cloud system where you have hundreds of GPUs in number crunch as much as you can. So that also means that traditionally speaking, performance was measured more in like accuracy or F1 score. How good is your model? How effective is your model? Um, and if you needed to spend double the effort to get 1% better, that's what you did. But we actually see the trend of this changing. So we move further and further towards the actual data source until hopefully, that's our vision, um, the AI will actually be on the embedded device directly or even on the implanted device. So we're also working on implanting AI systems. Okay? And then suddenly, the situation changes a lot. On the one hand, you have a lot of opportunities. You can now give certain guarantees. You can give timing guarantees. You can actually make sure your system keeps operating even if the cloud goes down or is unavailable. Um, but you also have new challenges because obviously you have to now take into care the overhead of your AI system. You have to optimize it to make it much more efficient. And efficiency sometimes is becoming more important than pure effectiveness. So that's where we are and this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, two application examples for this, two projects we are working in in this context. Uh, the first one is what I already mentioned, embedded or actually implantable AI. So we are in a project where we try to um, essentially include AI systems into neuro implants. So you have an implant in your brain which actually tries to detect um, brain activity and then the AI system is trying to make sense out of that data and it's trying to analyze the data directly uh, on the brain implant. That's one project we're in, and another one is um, a big project funded by the German government, which is trying to look into how can we use cloud AI, edge AI, and embedded AI to optimize critical infrastructures, specifically wastewater systems in this example, and especially in cases where we have a lot of rain, because Currently, it's often the situation that if there's too much rain and the wastewater system gets overloaded, then the wastewater just goes into nature. And that's something we want to change. Um, and we want to use AI to do so. OK, so how do you now put this AI, this complex machine learning algorithms on an embedded device? That's our main question. How do you cope with the challenges? Um, and to do so, we actually realize that there's certain challenges that you sh people usually face. Why many researchers actually don't really do so much work in this area. And the first one is you need hardware for this. You need your specific embedded hardware. So we started developing a hardware device. You also need software. You need a runtime system to actually operate your system. So we started developing a runtime system. And you also need to create the actual AI system and that's really, really complicated, uh, specifically if you are not a hardware expert. So we started generating um, essentially an AI generation tool, which we call the creator, which is able to optimize and generate hardware accelerators for AI systems. Um, our hardware, so we, many groups actually try to do everything in software we try to combine software solutions with hardware accelerators. 
And to do so, we developed our own hardware device, which at the core actually includes like uh, a short, a, a small MCU for your embedded software. So you run your application normally on the MCU. And then we have an FPGA, which is a special chip which can emulate other hardware chips. So you essentially can program the FPGA to execute some hardware accelerator much more efficiently than what you could do in software. And what you can do then with this system is you run your software on the MCU, you get your uh, your sensor values, and then if you find that, oh, oh no, I need some machine learning algorithm, you can actually configure the FPGA and tell it to deploy a specific hardware accelerator out of a set of available accelerators. <coughs> then you send it the data, the accelerator very efficiently does the computations, sends back the result, and then you either forward that stuff to the cloud via some wireless uh, communication, or you further want to work with it, so you actually tell the FPGA to use another hardware accelerator, reconfigure itself, and do the same thing again. Now, um, to do so, to actually use this, you also need a software side, as I was saying, so we also need a runtime system. And we essentially decided in our runtime to, um, to separate, let's say, the runtime into different parts. So we are focusing mostly on the, on the embedded side, um, but we also have a connection to the cloud and to the edge, which is based on standard technologies. You have a lot of uh, Docker containers, and everything is orchestrated by Kubernetes. And then what you can do with this is to actually um, either offer AI systems to applications, so if you have a cloud app, then uh, the cloud app can ask for data at the embedded device over our middleware, or it can also just directly ask the device to execute the machine learning locally, directly, or other way around, the embedded device can actually use the runtime system to provide services to it. So if, if your embedded device has some data and it figures out, okay, this is beyond my local AI capabilities, then it can just take the data, push it to the cloud, and execute some more elaborate, more powerful AI system there. And the third part, again, the creator, that's the, I would say these days, this is, this is more or less our core working area. So the others are, we still develop them, but this is where we actually spend most of our effort because we, we quickly realize that it is nearly impossible for machine learning experts to actually create optimized hardware accelerated uh, machine learning algorithms because you just need to know so much about the hardware optimizations. And it's also very difficult for the hardware expert, of course, to generate a good machine learning system because you need to, to know so much about machine learning. So we started creating our tool um, and the goal is to have a machine learning expert using PyTorch, so standard environment, you can just design your machine learning system like normal, and then you have our tool, which iteratively can optimize the system for you, give you feedback, and then if the result is sufficient for what you want, you can press a button and it generates, it auto-generates the, the, the finished accelerator, which you can then put on the FPGA. Um, and to do so, we actually developing, well, we're developing some of these optimization techniques, of course. So how do you design your AI system? How do you change the model design uh, such that these, this AI is more efficient? So you can put it more efficiently in hardware, let's say it like this. Um, and the other thing that we're developing is uh, this library. So this is usually components, hand-optimized hardware components for specific kinds of layers. So you have an optimized template for convolution. You have an optimized template for an LSTM. Um, I guess Chao will talk about that more. And uh, then the system is actually picking them, combining them, and trying to parameterize them in a way uh, such that you get an optimized overall solution. So um, that's great. 
But uh, of course the question is, so how, how do you optimize? What are some of these optimizations? And there's a lot of techniques, um, like pruning and whatever, and I just want to talk about one approach that we're actually using, um, which is pre-computation. If you know anything about embedded systems, you know that uh, pre-computation is pretty much embedded systems 101. That's the technique you use. You have an embedded system, you have a complex computation, it's too complex for your system, then you don't do the computation at runtime, you do it before, okay? So you pre-compute all the possible results for all the different inputs, and then you store everything on a map or in a table, essentially, um, and at runtime you just look up the result. Very easy, um, and we thought, okay, this is, this is usually done whenever you, you optimize something, but it's not really done for full layers, and that was the idea here. Can we do this for a full 1D convolutional layer? So what we tried to achieve is to pre-compute a complete 1D convolution, so all the computations that you normally do when you slide your filter over your data in a 1D convolution, right? That's what you usually do. Oh, sorry. Keep pressing the wrong button. Um, you slide a filter over it and each time uh, you slide it, you uh, do multiplication with all the inputs and weights, and then you add them all up, so you have many, many multiply accumulates, and that of course can cost a lot of time and effort, and this is actually what you don't want to do, instead you just want to pre-compute the whole thing and put all the results in the table, and uh, what's important here is we don't want to do that by storing everything in normal memory, because that would be too slow, because the memory access would be too slow. Instead, we actually want to put that directly in our circuit implementation on the FPGA, directly in the hardware accelerator. Um, so that was essentially what we set out to do. And if you are successful with this, then in theory, you should be incredibly fast for your computations, because you don't do them. But you may wonder, okay, if it's that great, why does why do we not do this normally? This is not what's, what's done normally. Why? What's the problem with this approach? And the problem is essentially that the size of this result table grows exponentially. It just grows very, very fast. Um, so this is essentially the formula that you can come up with to describe the size of your table that you need to describe such a layer. And as you can see, Unfortunately, we have a lot of factors that are multiplied, and more unfortunately, they're all in the exponent. So that's bad news. And just to t show you how bad that news is, this is a short example. It's a relatively small 1D convolution, five filters. Uh, kernel size is six. We have four input channels, so it's not too big. Um, and if you do the calculation, you will realize that you actually need a result table which has, uh, must have space for 10 to the power of 116 entries. And if you want to put that on your FPGA, you actually need uh, 10 to the power of 115 lookup tables. These are the, the small basic building blocks of FPGAs. So on the one hand, it's very nice. You can directly use these small building blocks efficiently. On the other hand, you see you need many of them. And if you then look at an actual FPGA, so Spartan uh, 7S100, for example, which is the biggest out of that family, and this is the family we usually are using in embedded systems, uh, you will see that, yeah, they have many LUTs, actually 64,000 LUTs, but that's just 10 to the power of four. So there's, there's some gap here. There's no way you can do this. All right, so it's a, it's a nice idea, but eh, okay. So what can you do? Well, there's essentially two things you can combine. 
First is you try to reduce the input domain by using quantization, heavy low bit quantization. And the second is you try to move the coefficients out of the exponent or at least try to move them out of this one common multiplication. And you, with these two techniques, you try to reduce the size of the result table as much as possible. And uh, so the first one, quantization, let me talk about that very briefly. Um, so what we try to change with quantization is essentially this B here. This B in the exponent, that's the bit with, that's what we try to reduce with quantization. Now quantization is a well-known technique. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, usually used, so it's, it's normally used whenever you try to make an AI system more efficient or a deep learning system more efficient. Quantization essentially just means that normally if you do not do any specific quantization, you will have all your, all your numbers will be 32-bit floating point numbers and all your calculations therefore will be relatively inefficient 32-bit floating point calculations. Um, and even worse, all your weights, every time you do these calculations you need to load new weights and since they're very big and there's many of them, that actually costs a lot of time. So loading and storing data is actually quite expensive. So you want to reduce that overhead. So what you do is you reduce the resolution of your numbers. So instead of saying you have 32-bit floating point, you go to 8-bit fixed point, for example, which, of course, is much, much smaller. The calculations can be done much faster. Loading data can be done much faster. So it's, it's a very well-known optimization technique. And for 8-bit fixed points, that's, that's usually industry standard these days. That's very easy to do. You don't need, you need a lot of tricks. Um, that's state of the art. But what you actually also can do and what you can look into is to use fewer bits. Right? So that's what we usually do. We try to use like 4-bit or 2-bit. Uh, some people also try to use 1-bit resolution and surprisingly it actually works, but you need more and more complex tricks for it to actually work. So that's the first technique. And what you should note is that this is done to make the, com the computations more efficient, but we actually are not interested in that because we don't do computations at runtime. We do pre-calculations. So we can actually do this slightly different. Um, because we are just interested in the quantization of the input data. That's the only thing that's in our formula. So we can actually use full resolution weights, which makes the result uh, much more, or much easier to actually get a good result, good efficiency, good effectiveness, I'm sorry. Um, so that's the first approach that you can actually use. The second thing you can do is to try and move these factors out of the common multiplication in the exponent, you can do layer splitting. So now we actually try to look into all of these factors. Okay? Layer splitting is also a very well-known technique. Um, one very famous example, which we're actually also using, is step by separable convolution. The idea is that instead of having a one dense convolution where all your input channels come in and are multiplied with different full uh, filters, and then you get the individual outputs. You actually um, combine each input channel with the same filter, but each individually, and then you combine all the intermediate input data now, your intermediate results, with different pointwise much smaller filters, right? So you actually splitted this one convolution up into a two-step convolution, let's say, okay? And this is usually done to reduce the number of weights, which again, we are not really interested in because the weights go away. We don't have them at the runtime anymore or everything is pre-computed. Uh, so we're only interested in the input results, but what we actually also find is that, so this is the original formula, right, for this is the size of the result table. And if we 
apply depth by separable convolution, we split it up into these two layers, then this formula changes into this formula. And what you can see is that the C and the N move into different exponents. They're not in the same multiplication anymore. Both of them are just multiplied with B. But B is the thing that we actually just reduced with quantization, ideally down to one. So that, in the ideal case, B actually also goes away. And you only have two to the power of C and two plus two to the power of n. So that's essentially the approach. And that works surprisingly well. If you do this, then um, if you compare this to our original situation, where we had 10 to the power of 115 LUTs, and you do two-bit quantization, then you have 10 to the power of 13 entries or, or LUTs that you actually need on your device, which are still too much, but it's getting better. And then if you combine that with depth by separable convolution, you actually only need 10 to the power of three, so 1,000 LUTs. And suddenly you are able to not store, not just store one of them on uh, your FPGA, but actually store maybe 50 of them on your FPGA. So you can actually now start building bigger, deeper, pre-computed networks um, where you don't have to care at all about computations or the speed of computations. And um, so we did this in a project. This is one example we analyzed. The project was about analyzing heart diseases using ECG data. And with the techniques I just told you, we were able to actually speed that up to be able to do uh, 19,000 inferences per second, uh, which meant that we had an energy consumption of four microjoule, microjoule each. Um, and if you compare that, if you want to get the same speed on a standard CPU, then you would actually need uh, a core i7 with 2.5 gigahertz. And that would cost you not more, just more money, but it would also cost you more than 400 times the energy. So in a sense, we were able to compare to a classical situation, a classical system, we were able to reduce the energy consumption uh, by a factor of 400. Yeah. And that's essentially the quick introduction I wanted to give you. As I was saying, there will be more details coming. And um, yeah, concluding. We deeply believe that AI systems are getting embedded. In the future, you will see, seldomly see, I think, that you only have a remote cloud-based system for your AI. You always will have at least a partial AI implementation on the local device or on a nearby device. If you do so, then efficiency becomes very, very critical, which is actually also true because of the whole green AI movement. So. That's another advantage here. You can be more energy efficient. You can be more environmentally friendly with these techniques compared to the cloud. But to get there, you need sophisticated optimization techniques. And optimizing these is actually really hard. So this is an active research topic, which I think will not go away in the next few years. That will, be, uh, will stay a very active research area. Um, specifically, if you look into systems where you have very bad data quality, which is unfortunately the case in many systems that we look at, where you have relatively cheap sensors that um, have very bad data quality. So our goal essentially is to say, not just for us, but also for the community, to say if you want to do research in this area, you can't stop from zero. You need some starting point, and we think this is our framework. This is our ecosystem to actually have the hardware that you can use to do your experiments. You have some infrastructure, some, some software infrastructure to combine it with your application, to combine it with your cloud. And then, of course, you have the creator who is supposed to help you at least generate efficient AI systems um, without you needing to know everything about the hardware. It's all open source. It's all open hardware. So if you like, you can get involved. And with that, 
I'm at the end of my talk. And thanks for the attention. I hope there's some questions. Does the model designer need to know Verilog or something, uh, something like this? Need to know the optimization techniques? No, uh, the um, Verilog or VHDL code. Oh, no, 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 no. O only Python? No, no, only Python. Oh. That's exactly the point. Because uh, that, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. You don't want your AI developer to learn VHDL or Verilog or uh, any other hardware description language. That's, uh, it's just, just, just too complicated for most. And so that's exactly what the tool is taking away from you. You just work in PyTorch, and you use PyTorch, sometimes PyTorch replacement layers, uh, which already include some of the optimizations. So you actually, when you train your system, you already know how well it will perform. Because that's other, uh, another difference. Many of these tools, you, you create a system, you have your model, then you put it on the hardware, and then it performs poorly. Because it did some crazy optimizations in between which it didn't tell you about. In our system, you know exactly how it will perform. And you can actually actively try to retrain it all the time to get away most of the error as much as possible. But you never need to know any of the hardware um, specifics. All you need to do is you use PyTorch, you keep training your system, you change the hyperparameters, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for, for your presentation. You mentioned from the very beginning of your lecture about uh, AI embedded in a near neural implants. Speaking future-wise, can we say that, uh, could we say that uh, it, for example, we can create nanorobots with, uh, yes, which receives signals from this AI implant and can correct the operations in a flowing in a bloodstream. And uh, using all your conventional, con convolutional networks and data optimization techniques and so on, uh, is it possible in the future to go a step further and do, it, do that? I mean, I hope. Yes, sure. That would be great. Uh, but to be realistic, I think for the next few years, maybe 10 years, we will still be stuck at this first stage to put the AI actually on the implant and to make that, to, to actually really do experiments, I mean, eventually with humans to actually do that. We were far away from that, right? So right now, I think that the challenge that we still need to overcome is um, also to make sure that the heat is in check. You always make sure you're not, there's not too much heat so you don't damage the cells and stuff. Um, so we're relatively basic at the moment, but I think the potential is, is actually really huge because it, with these systems, um, you can use much more sophisticated data analysis algorithms in, um, let's say, five, 10 years to do your actual analysis. And if you think about what we can do already today with much simpler algorithms, then I think it will be very interesting to see what we can do. Then if you, if you give us the nanobots, <laughs> okay, sure, great. Um, that would be very interesting to put, to see what happens if we can actually um, do deep learning algorithms on the nanobots, maybe. Um, that would be incredibly, incredibly nice. Very, very, oh, I have to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The potential is great, I think. It's, it's just enormous. If you think about the techniques that are used today in these systems, they're very, very basic still. Okay. Uh, hey. Uh, from optimization, uh, you mentioned quantization. Did you use ONNX? Uh, did you convert your model to ONNX or you used another approach? 
And also these optimizations uh, usually reduce accuracy. How much was your accuracy lost? Okay, so ONNX. Um, ONNX is mainly a, like an exchange language, right? Exchange format. Um, actually, when we started, there, were, there wasn't even, an, which has changed by now, but there wasn't really a, a good way to formulate more sophisticated quantizations in ONNX. So we actually decided against using, against using ONNX, also because at the time we didn't really need to exchange between different tools. Um, that proved to be uh, somewhat <laughs> difficult when we switched from TensorFlow to PyTorch, because we had to re-implement a lot of the things. Um, but still, right now we just don't need ONNX, so we don't really use it. Um, and we also don't really use the, you can use the standard quantization approaches that are now included in PyTorch, but we actually have our own implementations. And um, we also look into more elaborate, I mean, it's not just how many bits are you using, right? It's also what specific quantization approach are you using? So we're looking at, in reality, we're looking a little bit more into this. Um, and I think I forgot your second question. The accuracy, um, yeah, there is, there is an accuracy loss. I don't really know the number right now. Does anyone remember the exact number of loss? Yeah, yeah. But um, we were able to, yeah. yeah. I, I should mention that uh, in this specific project, and in many projects actually, it turns out that your application partner actually has a really good understanding of the accuracy they need. So they will tell you this is, this is what we need, and then they will not care if you can get better. That's, um, that, that was also the case in this project. So 95 was fine. They were like, okay, sure. And in other settings, I think, um, because we can combine it with cloud, um, a, a very common approach is actually also to have an, a very reduced model locally, which is finding a lot of false positives. So you try to err on the side of the false positives, and then whenever you, you have a finding, you actually check again in the cloud, right? That's a very good way to actually achieve. If you really need like the highest accuracy that you need, then you can do it like this. Otherwise, you just do it locally and then you try to optimize it towards. But um, it takes some time, yeah, it is, it is some effort. Um, that's also why we have this iterative approach because it turns out that if you just have the tool and it automatically tries to optimize, then the result is not always very good. But if you, as an AI expert, actually then look at it and like, uh, maybe I can just change the model a little bit. I can add another layer. I can change the width of the filters or something like this. And then retrain. Um, if you do that several times, then you can actually achieve a really, really good quality. Now that, of course, is effort again. You need to search yourself. This is why we also look into how you can use uh, neural architecture search to do that for you. Uh, that's what Chris will talk about. Um, but that's not included in the tool yet. So right now you have to search for it yourself. Okay. One technical question though. PyTorch versus TensorFlow. Why are you using PyTorch? How is it more powerful specifically for your domain? It's more flexible. It's not really more powerful in the sense, but TensorFlow is very good at hiding stuff from you. So as an application developer, 
TensorFlow is great. Um, it takes away all, all the like details you don't really care about too much in most cases. Um, but PyTorch exposes them, so it was, it's easier for us to actually modify them and change them in, in the way we want. That's essentially the, the main reason. And to be quite honest, another reason was that we realized that in many research environments, if you want to compare against other solutions, uh, more often you get the, the, the model descriptions in PyTorch. So it's just easier for us to compare to, to others. We, you mean with respect to, to what exactly? Just speed of execution when you have Python implemented. TensorFlow implementation is exactly the same as PyTorch one. Then you are trying to compare resource consumption or maybe the speed of execution. Or just we uh, did, um, I don't think so because we are actually, that's, that's actually not our focus. If you use, TensorFlow or PyTorch directly, and then you want to put it on a, on a GPU, for example. Um, yeah, you can do that, but that's, for us, that's not really what, what we're trying to do. We try to put it on the hardware accelerator. That's also why um, you can compare it to, also to, to TensorFlow Lite Micro or something like this. But again, the target is a different one. You have an MCU, and you will be much, much slower compared to the hardware accelerator. But of course, you only need an MCU. So that's, that's the <laughs> design space. Are you willing to actually have an FPGA? Then you can speed it up a lot with tools like this. Or are you like, no, it's, it's fine. I don't need it that much speed. But then you can get away with just having an MCU. And then I think TensorFlow becomes more interesting again. That's also, to be honest, why we started with TensorFlow. But, yeah, so it was more a pragmatic move. But, yeah. I assume that you have measurements in your head, so I will ask you about that later. Okay? I, I, don't, I didn't want to say it's the most simple. I just wanted to say it's a simple because you can just, this idea of a, um, of a result table is essentially what the FPGA is built of, right? That's, I said that the FPGA is emulating other chips and it's doing so by using lookup tables. So it, the basic structure of an FPGA is actually these lookup tables. So it was very, it's very easy to, to map that to a bigger result table. So it's, it's a very good fit. That's what I wanted to say. But of course, it's not the only technique that we're using. So again, Zhao will talk about LSTMs, where there's also a, a little bit of pre-computation, but totally different, pre-computing activation functions. You can't always pre-compute everything. And it was just our part where we tried to, as I was saying, be as fast as possible. That was the main goal. And that also turns out to be very efficient energy-wise, of course, right? But the more, it's more, it's really like you need an AI system that can do thousands and thousands of inferences per second very easily. Okay. Ben? Thank you. Thank you.